and you're like, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is impossible. I can't do this. I'm failing. I suck. I'm holding my team back. And they quit because they mistake themselves. You know, they think that these thoughts represent, you know, who they are. And they don't recognize that this too shall pass. Right? Great. Well, Commander Divine, it's great to be with you. Liam, thanks for having me. Super nice to meet you. Yeah, well, so I thought so, to start, I mean, everyone's heard of the Navy SEALs, but few few people heed the call and then even fewer make it through that training. So what brought you to that unusual path and made you make that kind of one of your missions? Hmm. Um, a little bit of insanity. <laughs> <laughs> temporary insanity no you know ironically because you know, we were just talking about your mission with fit mind it was i truly can attest with 100 percent confidence that it was the practice of zen meditation that brought me into the seals and you know most people were like huh like how do the two of those fit together i was you know i grew up in upstate new york i was condition to basically be a business guy, follow the footsteps into the family business that my father had followed. And our family business was, you know, over 100 years old. So I was trained for that from a very young age, you know. And as you know, if you're not training your mind, someone else is. And um, not deliberately, it just happens. And so I went to Colgate University, upstate New York, I went from there down to New York City, took a job with Coopers and Librin, which was a big accounting firm. And uh, as part of that package, I was sent to NYU or I went to NYU business school. So there I was uh, after college, getting my MBA, working toward my certified public accountancy, working as an auditor, and then later as a consultant and barreling toward a white collar career that would likely have seen me back upstate New York at the family business, you know, anywhere from four to 10 years later. Incidentally, all of my siblings, all three of them are there and all of their kids are there, except for one who followed me into the SEALs. <laughs> so I have a nephew who's now a Navy SEAL. So he broke free just like me. But at any rate, I had no model. I didn't have an uncle or I, don't, I didn't know anybody in the military. The military was completely poo-pooed by my family. There was really only one path for us. And so that's the story, right? That was the storyline that I was living because I hadn't examined it because I never heard of meditation. And then one day I, I'd wanted to get into a martial art and that's a whole different story as to why, but it was inspiring to me. And, and um, so about six months after moving to New York, I was walking down 23rd street. I was living on 22nd. So this is not the first time I walked down 23rd street, but because I was looking for a martial arts studio, studio for the first time, I actually saw the studio and it was there. And it was World Sado head Headquarters, Sado Karate. And I heard the noise and I was like, oh my God, there it is. I've been looking for a martial arts studio. We're kind of like contemplating it, but I hadn't taken action. Boom, there it was. Walked right by. And so I was compelled to go upstairs. I literally was almost like, I couldn't not go up the stairs. I don't know if you ever had moments like that. So my spirit was drawing me up there, you know, because I was still kind of, I was nervous. I was like, I don't know if I could do that. But I, there I am walking up the stairs, right? <laughs> Almost against my will, it seemed like. And I opened up the door and there were probably 75 to 100 students of varying degrees, so to speak, you know, from early students to fourth, fifth, sixth degree black belts. And the man that was leading the class was this Japanese guy. He was in his 40s and he was kind of short, but had a huge presence, very fit. And his name was Tadashi Nakamura. He was the founder of the school. And uh, I just observed him for a while. And I was like, wow, there's something really different about this guy. I couldn't really quite put my finger on it. But I was super motivated. And I signed up on the spot. And he became my mentor. And what I found out was that he was a Zen master, but also a martial arts master. He's a 10th degree black belt founder of this school. There's no way I could have told this story in like 30 seconds. Sorry about that. <laughs> this is great. So I, um, I started training karate and I learned that uh, within, very quickly, I learned that he had a, a special Thursday night Zen meditation class that a lot of black belts attended. 
And um, I asked if I could join the class and he, he said, sure, you know, I think he was excited that one more person was interested because when I showed up at class, there were only about eight or 10 students and this school had hundreds and hundreds of students. It's right in the middle of Midtown Manhattan and it had a fierce reputation for developing just incredible people. So um, that's, that was my introduction to meditation. So I started the practice of Zen, which, you know, which is a catch-all for a lot of different practices, but I didn't know that. And it, it was, I called it uh, concentration boot camp, you know, because the first thing they tried to, Nakamura had me do was just to try to concentrate on my breath and count to 10. Inhale, exhale one, inhale, exhale two. And any time your mind, any time you wandered off that, you know, you were supposed to penalize yourself and go back to zero, right? So it, it had kind of like that Zen austere quality to it, which doesn't work for everyone. And it didn't work for me initially, but because I really, really respected Nakamura and I, I just stuck with the practice, but I, after a while I stopped efforting so much. When I was efforting, I wasn't getting anywhere. So I stopped efforting and I just started to enjoy going to these practices because I would feel amazing when I was done. And I would also find that eventually I would just kind of drop off into this state of like no thought. Anyways, I'm getting back to your question because it was in those moments of no thought where I would come out and be like, whoa. And then I'd kind of regret it a little bit because like, that felt really good. But it also seemed like I brought something back from those places because I would have insights and I had, I had this sense, growing sense every time I practiced that um, I was missing something, right? Mm -hmm. I was missing something. And so um, I started to reflect upon what, what I could be missing. And that's when I started a journaling practice, right? And I was like, just copiously taking notes and starting to read about meditation. I read Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind by Suzuki and M Miyamari Musashi's Book of Five Rings. And, you know, I just like dove in into the warrior lifestyle. And this um, popped up a lot of in interesting questions that I started to ask. And then I would, you know, go into my meditation sessions with those questions and that would surface stuff. And, and so about two years into this whole practice, and I literally had this epiphany that I was living the wrong story. Mm. That everything that I was doing, everything I had thought was about my life uh, was really not accurate. It wasn't who I was. It was not this bundle of thoughts and emotions that said you're going to be a CPA and then, you know, you're going to make a lot of money and you go back to the family mm -hmm. business and you're going to make even more money and blah, blah, blah. So my entire sense of identity kind of started to break down and that was kind of a scary transition. Hmm. As, my, as my original identity started to dissolve, I had to replace it with something hmm. or so I thought. So I started asking questions, you know, like if not that, then what? Who am I? And when I sat with those questions before, during, and after my meditation sessions, what kept coming back to me was I'm a warrior. I'm meant to be a warrior. You know, I now know that that was my dharma or my calling, you know, kind of revealing itself to me. But at the time, all I got was a sensation. It's like an archetypal urge almost hmm. that I'm meant to be a warrior. And I'm not fulfilling that by sitting in a desk and crunching numbers as a CPA. You know what I mean? Yeah. Nor would I fulfill it really, not that I couldn't fulfill it in business, but at the time, that's not what I was being called toward because I was also a very athletic guy. I was an elite athlete, competitive swimmer, competitive rower, uh, almost Olympic level rower, but I didn't quite have the skill set to get there. Triathlete, et cetera. And, um, and I was also a risk taker and a little bit of a, um, a loner, you might say. <laughs> sounds a lot like a navy seal and um so i was called when i when i thought warrior i didn't think you know corporate warrior right or someone who's going to go join greenpeace and become an environmental warrior i thought like real warrior you know what i mean yeah. like someone who's going to go serve and protect humanity or you know that was my initial yeah. concept <laughs> so um when that feeling and insight came over to me, I sat with it for a few weeks. And one night I was walking home from work and that was a second moment where I was just kind of being driven by some other force. 
because I took a route that was completely unnew or new, unknown or new to me. And I passed by a Navy recruiting office and it was closed because it was nighttime. But in the window was this poster and the poster, the title of the poster, or the top of it said, be someone special. And then the pictures in the poster just blew me away. They, they were Navy SEALs doing cool Navy SEAL shit, jumping out of an airplane and you know, a sniper in a hide site that you could barely make out. You had to like look really closely and frogmen kind of coming out of the water and sneaking up on the beach and out in the water, a submarine where two little Navy SEALs were driving this mini submersible. And I was like, wow, that's what I want to do. That's it right there. You know, the universe showed me again when I was ready. So the rest is kind of more of the details of how I got in, but it was meditation that caused me to slow down, you know, create the, the witnessing aspect or the metacognitive, first the metacognitive capability to start to examine my thoughts and then to eventually connect to my awakened awareness, the witness that Dan Brown talks about, where I was then able to, you know, I wouldn't say at that early age, I was stabilized in it, but I was able to shift back and forth fairly easy by the time, you know, four years into my practice. And that allowed me to be, you know, incidentally, when I went to SEAL training, by the way, this is kind of ironic, but in 1989, so this all happened between 1985 and 1989, 1989, I got my MBA, I got my certified public accountancy certificate, I tested and received my black, my first degree black belt, all in the same month, November, and in that same month in November, 1989, I got on a bus to officer candidate school and left it all behind everything. And wow. that was my, that was my entry into the Navy. So four years of this intense meditative process while simultaneously, I didn't turn my back on my initial commitment. I, I stuck it out. I got the MBA, got the CPA, you know, I worked as an auditor every day, which was like sticking needles in my eye. And then I turned my back on it all and went to officer mm -hmm. candidate school and I went to SEAL training, graduate 185 students, 19 of us graduated and I graduated as honor man of my class and my entire boat crew of six others were there with me on graduation day. Mm -hmm. And I attribute all that to my meditation practice too, because it gave me that kind of present moment awareness that and it doesn't matter. It did not matter what chaos the instructors were raining down on us because, you know, Bud's is like simulated war. And uh, it didn't matter because, you know, I recognized I couldn't control any of that. The only thing I could mm -hmm. control was what was going on inside my mind and my body, thoughts and emotions. Mm -hmm. And uh, that allowed me to really tap into flow and to be, you know, just to be more humble and present with my teammates and to put my attention on them and not really you know, just be focused on my own needs. And so my team had, my boat crew team had a lot, a lot of energy at times where everyone else was really sucking wind, you know, mm. it's fascinating. Yeah. Anyways, it, I could, I could ramble on for hours about this, but. So. Well, no, please do. But, um, it's just so counterintuitive that it, that it, uh, that it was meditation that led you to this warrior mentality and, it makes a lot of sense. I, I can really relate to at least the first part of the story because after college, I was, I went into private equity and was headed into business like the rest of my family. And that's when my meditation practice really took off. And actually like you, I think Zen mind, beginner's mind was one of my first introductions. Nice. And when you go beyond thought, as you mentioned, Dan Brown, who's a, a mutual meditation teacher, talks about going beyond thought. And mm -hmm. when you stop that internal chatter, which is largely conditioned thinking from the people you've been surrounded to, mm -hmm. there's kind of this genuine voice that surfaces where, as you talked about, these insights come about your kind of your true calling or something that's more aligned with who you really are. Um, right. So I'm I'm curious then, as you entered the SEALs, um, could you just talk a little bit about that experience? I know people are fascinated by Navy SEAL training because it's seen as as the epitome of kind of both mental and physical training for mm -hmm. real, real world, you know, modern day warriors. Um, what were some of the, or what was maybe the toughest moment or challenge that you encountered? Yeah, there's so many. Um... 
keep in mind that you know what what a lot of the students really struggle with i mean students struggle with different things but you know seals is an acronym for sea air land but we don't stray far from the first part the c part so it really helps to be comfortable in the water and i grew up on a lake in upstate new york right and so i was uh, always on the water under the water i was had many close calls you know um, diving in the lake and you know doing crazy shit and so i was very comfortable and i was a competitive swimmer like the very first e even this story will exemplify it so when i showed up i was actually scheduled to class up in a, a, a numbered class called one seven or numbered 171 and i learned that on i showed up on a friday i learned that this class was actually next in line that on monday of the following week class number 170 was going to start class they call it classing up was going to start training and that class 171 wouldn't start training for another eight or nine weeks which to me felt like a lifetime i was ready to go and so i you know i was like i i gotta figure out how to get into this class and i asked a few people like i saw around i didn't know anybody i'd never even been to california and, you know, I was a newly minted ensign that didn't know anything about the Navy, really, or protocol or anything like that. I mean, I, I didn't really care about any of the protocol, you know, saluting or rank structure. I just wanted to be a badass Navy SEAL. And so I just started asking people. I was like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm Ensign Divine, and I just got here, and, and my order say I'm supposed to start in 171, but I really want to class up on Monday in 170. And people are just looking at me like, what? <laughs> no, you're going to start in 171. And finally, I got someone to say, you know what? go to go to the combat training tank which is like seal speak for a navy uh, for a pool and uh because that's where lieutenant may has the class class 170 they're doing pool drills and if anyone could get you into the class it would be him because he's the the proctor i guess for that class so i made my way over to the combat training tank which is massive olympic size swimming pool with, which is really deep and it's got observation windows all underneath the water you know so you can watch you know safety observers and stuff like that and i enter the pool and there's 184 other guys standing along the pool and they've been doing crossovers and all sorts of crazy drills and up on this uh, high diving board was this tan blonde blue-eyed you know kind of like if there was a poster for navy seal it would have been this guy Lieutenant Rick May, the 6'4", just eminently fit, total surfer stud. And, and I walk in and everyone goes quiet because I had just invaded their space, right? And Zink, oh, not Zinky, but this Lieutenant May looks down and he says, Enzyme, which was his derogatory term for ensign. He goes, what brings you into our, you know, into our space here? And I said, uh, Lieutenant May, I'm Ensign Divine, and uh, I've got orders to Class 171, but I really want to class up with Class 170 on Monday. And he looks at me and goes, well, that's not normal. And I think what he meant is that everyone else would take all that extra time to prepare, right? They'd be grateful for it. And I was like, no, I want to go now, capital N now. So he said, hmm, he goes, all right, well, how about you just jump jump in the pool right now and prove to me that you can swim underwater for 50 meters and i said okay and i was thinking to myself no problem and so i started to take my boots off you know and i was going to take my and i had shorts on underneath and he goes no 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 you know the way you are right now jump in and i'm thinking oh shit, that's a little different right <laughs> swimming 50 meters underwater combat boots so I, you know, I thought to myself, fuck it. You know what I mean? I've, I've got this. And so I went back into my Zen mind and I just like, oh, just breathe into it and really calm myself and relax. And this all happened in like just a few seconds. And I took three of the biggest breaths I've ever taken in my life. And I just launched myself off the side of the pool. And fortunately I was a breaststroker. So I really knew how to do, you know, I had a really strong pull out with my arms. You know, when I swam underwater, I could go a long way. But I tried kicking and it was almost useless, right? It actually was a waste of energy. So there I am with my clothes on and these combat boots and I'm trying to, you know, I'm swimming underwater and I'm just, 
I really had to, you know, go, go deep into my resolve because by the time I hit the far side and did my turn, I was gassed. And, and I, you know, I, I was still 10 feet underwater, but I was like, I don't think I can do this. So I just turned and said, I've got this. Failure is not an option. Basically, I've got to do this. And I kicked off the wall with more might than, you know, more energy than I think I've ever mustered in my life. And I just glided. I just glided as far as I could and then pulled like three times with all my might. And I'm starting to kind of go as if I'm going to black out, but I'm like telling myself, my witness is there going, just keep going. You got this. And I finally was able to just touch the wall and, and it just, you know, kind of crawled up and came to the surface. I took a deep breath. I was like, oh shit, I made it. Crawled out of the pool. Some guys kind of like hauling me out and stood up and May said to me, he goes, meet me in my office this afternoon at four o'clock. And I classed up on Monday with that class. That was simple, right? But it, it gave me a sense for what was coming, right? So the water evolution is like wanting, you know, people have heard about things like drown proofing, but maybe listeners don't really know what it is. So that was another one. In the class, we, um, they tie your hands behind your back and they tie our ankles together. And then we've got to swim 200 meters that way. Right? First, what you do is you have you bob up and down. It's not that, that alone wipes out a lot of people because they, they just don't know how to relax. And so they start to panic. Right? And so you're, you're in this 15 foot or I don't even know how deep it is, the deep end of the pool. And you have to just relax and go down with your hands, feet tied, touch the bottom, push off. You can't use your arms or anything, and you just got to shoot up as far and hope that you're, you know, you break the surface. If you don't break the surface, you're screwed. And they have instructors down there with tanks on them to pull you out. And so, because I was able to relax and just really calm myself and not really waste any oxygen, and because I'm a, a, I was a swimmer, I was able to do really well in that. And then, as far as swimming, you know, it's just kind of like a dolphin. You just start, you just porpoise your body. And um, so that evolution was easy, but it, it really wiped out a lot of guys. And another one was, um, they call it pool competency. And this is where, this is another one that a lot of people fail on and they get kicked out of buzz because what you do is you put on a dive rig. That's an old dive rig that has these double, they call a double hose regulator. It's two old rubber hoses. And you go out and you down the rig and then you go out in the middle of the pool and then you go to the bottom and you just sit there and wait. And then within moments you get attacked by a couple instructors and they rip all your gear off your fins your mask the dive rig gets ripped off and then they take the regulator or this hose these two hoses and they tie them in a knot like these nasty knots so that no air can come out and then they give you a signal and you're, you don't have a mask on but they tap you on the shoulder and that means okay now it's your turn go get your gear and get everything back on and get the air, you know, get everything back as if nothing had happened. And if you can do that and not lose your cool, then you can ascend back to the surface and you pass. But you got to do every, you got to do everything perfectly. You got to put the gear in the right order. You've got to, you know, follow all the procedures. And you don't have any air, right? <laughs> so if you freak out, you're done. And so, you, you know, for me, it was like, okay, the first time I just calmly found my mask, I cleared my mask and went over, found the dive rig and I started working on getting some air because I, I didn't want to put the rig on. So I, my first thing that I needed to do was to figure out how to get some air out and then to use the air to replenish my supply because I, I could stay down there forever to solve the problem if I could just get some air out of the rig. And so I'm like putting my foot against the rig and, you know, yanking on this knot that the instructor tied in it. And, and it was a doozy and I, I must've worked probably two to three minutes trying to get that thing open. And finally I, I saw just a tiny stream of bubbles come out and I just started, you know, I put my mouth over it and I started capturing those bubbles and, um, and they gave me some extra time and I worked them out a little bit more. So I captured some more, worked it out a little bit more, captured more about six or seven minutes down there. Finally, the knot just releases and this flood of air comes through the regulator. And um, I take a few deep breaths and then I don the rig properly. Then I find my fins and, and then the instructor's just smiling at me, you know, and he gives me the, the AOK sign. 
I didn't mention that when they attack you, they really attack you. I mean, they beat the shit out of you underwater, right? And this is the thing people don't realize. Like seal instructors, they are brutal, especially they're brutal in a good way, but especially when they're outside of like the eyes of, you know, where other people are watching. So anytime you're underwater, like the pool comp or even life saving, man, you you can you you get some serious shit thrown at you by these instructors. And the reason is that they are their mission is to choose their next batch of teammates. They don't give a shit what school you went to, whether you were the best looking or the a guy or the best athlete and the quarterback of the football team. They don't care if you were an Olympic swimmer, Olympic rower, you know, Olympic triathlete. It, it doesn't matter to any of them. What they care about is, are you going to be a good teammate? Are you going to have their back? And, or are you going to freak out in combat and get people killed? Maybe them. So you, you have these guys who actually are, are kind of good performers in a lot of ways because they're stud athletes, but they're really egocentric or they just can't, they haven't developed enough to take their eyes off themselves and put them on their teammates or to be calm and, and you know, calm under pressure or to have a good sense of humor in spite of all the chaos and, and cold and misery that's going around them. So, so negative people, even if you're performing well, physically tend to get washed out because the instructors will beat them up and we'll find ways to make them fail. Cause who, who wants negative people on the team? Even if you're a great athlete, right? Or a great, got other great skills. And same thing with egotistical or arrogant students. You know, they might be making all the measures, right? In terms of the performance and time runs, time swims, times optical course, they could pass pool comp and all that. But there's gonna be a moment where the instructors just find an opportunity to create a failure, right? So stuff like that, the, the, the most um, probably well-known aspect of SEAL training is Hell Week. So by the time we started, I mentioned with 185 students, Hell Week for us was week seven. They, they change it up every once in a while. So I think right now it's even like week two or three just to get it over with. And because what they found is, you know, if you can't make it through Hell Week, you, you're just not going to make it through training. So let's get those people out of training early to save us money. You know, it's probably what they're thinking. So we had 185 students start. By the time we got the hell week, I think we were down to like 80 or 85. So we already lost 100 guys with things like pool comp was later on, but things like um, time swims, time ops, of course, who just couldn't meet the times or quitting, they just quit. I had a good friend of mine who quit on the very first evolution, the very first day. And he just couldn't control his mind. And hell week is another example of that. So the different things get different people. Hell Week's uh, determined, Hell Week's goal is to simulate the worst of combat when you have no sleep for five days or six days, five nights. So it starts on Sunday afternoon and ends on Friday and you don't sleep. You get one sleep break for th te technically for three or four hours on Thursday. So you're cold, wet, exhausted, miserable and doing really hard stuff the entire time, right? From Sunday to Friday. And I think we lost like another 45 guys and most of them quit within the first 48 hours. And they quit, again, I'll, I'll go back to attributing this to meditation. They quit because they could not control a few things. One, they couldn't control their sense of time. They just kept obsessing about how much time was left how many days, how many hours was left in this training? And they've already done it for 24 or 36 hours and they're exhausted and they just can't imagine doing this for another four days, right? Or three days. So they quit. Another is they have a particularly rough moment, like in log PT, you know, seven guys carrying a 355 pound log up and down the berms and racing with it and and you keep failing and you're physically failing and your mind and emotions are getting, you know, really negative. And you're like, I can't do this. I can't do this. This is impossible. I can't do this. I'm failing. I suck. I'm holding my team back. And they quit because they mistake themselves. You know, they think that these thoughts represent, you know, who they are. 
and they don't recognize that this too shall pass, right? And a lot of times what, what the instructors are doing is they're creating the conditions for this to happen. And then when it happens to enough people, the evolution's over, right? And so a lot of times, you know, you'll get these guys quitting, like, I can't do this anymore. And they quit. And then literally, like a minute later, the instructors secure the evolution. And, and this poor, poor side is looking at it going, crap, if I just held on for one more minute, I would not be standing here on the sidelines, you know, as a quitter. Not, that stuff really didn't affect me because of the training I had. Right. I recognized that I needed to take a radically short term focus during Hell Week. And I just focused on really what am I doing right now? They're asking me to carry this log up the hill. Just carry this log up the hill. Don't worry about what comes after that. It took some practice, but I pretty quickly recognized that was that was the way to get through the training. Just focus on what's right in front of you. Don't worry about what's coming in the future. Certainly, you don't have time to worry about what happened all right, in the past. And then to put your eyes on your teammate. Like this is one of the most powerful skills for leaders is like, it's not about you, Mr. or Mrs. Leader. It really is not about you. It's about everyone else. And if you're like, for me, because I was a leader, like, well, I'm not going to have all the ideas and I'm not going to be the one who's like the hero to carry this boat, you know, while everyone else slacks off. It's, I need everybody to be carrying their load. And the only way that they're going to do that is if I support them. And I make it about them. Hmm. So I promised to, you know, do everything I could to help my team get through the training, get through the night, get through the evolution, have fun, you know, and I was, we we're always cracking jokes and I'm always, you know, I became kind of the morale officer to keep people positive and, and stay focused and recognize that this is going to be over soon and that we got this. And we actually developed so much momentum and energy that we just, we were winning all these, all the events. We even got secured two to three hours early on Hell Week. And we got to go take a nice warm shower for about an hour, get into dry clothes, which we hadn't been in for weeks, you know, and our bodies are just wrecked and all raw from all the sand being rubbed in and infected and just nasty, but we just felt like a million bucks. And we went back out into the beach, all cozy and warm while the class was still getting hammered. And we felt like a, a million bucks. So Hell Week, though, is, man, it's, it's brutal. Still, though, you know, 40, 40 to 45 people left in my class. But we had, we had um, you know, eight, seven months still to go of training. Wow. And so that's the third thing that gets people is just they get worn down, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to develop this, what I call one day, one life mindset that, you know, every day you got to take certain actions and and hone your mind and emotions and body to restore it to yesterday's state, right? To be, to not allow the grind to get you down or to take you off course or lead you to an injury. So because of my martial arts training, I really knew how to stretch. And so I would, you know, I wake up half hour early and I would stretch and I would do my box breathing. And um, I would continue to stay as present as possible and not really think about how many days were left or, you know, so it's very similar. It's more of a condensed or elongated version of what I was talking about with Hell Week is like, just all that mattered was today. Let's just do the best I can today. Keep my body healthy and keep my mind positive and just focus on the tasks hmm. because guys would just start getting ground down and injured and, and, uh, and lose their motivation. And so if you lose your motivation, then you're toast. And usually the thing that causes people to lose their motivation is lack of clarity. They thought they knew why they wanted to be a Navy SEAL. And that was enough to get them through the first, get, even get them through hell week because they're really strong and they're not quitters. But you can be strong and not, not a quitter, but if your why isn't right, if it's not on point, or if you're misaligned, let's just say, you know, you, you really thought you wanted to be a Navy SEAL because your dad was a Navy SEAL, but you never really did the work we were, we were talking about, about, you know, is this really my calling? Is this my Dharma? You know, what happens is, you know, by, by month five or six, you're just being ground down and, and it's exasperating and you're, you start to question, why am I here? 
I know, I know guys who literally quit in the last week of training because they recognized that they, they really couldn't remember why they joined the SEALs. It was for some glory or because it was cool on TV when they saw it or, or they truly recognize as a result of that process that they're, they were meant to do something else. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? So yeah, it's important to re be really clear when you're going to go into something. You know, I, I'm working, I work with a lot of SEAL candidates and this is, applies to pretty much anyone going into the military, especially a special operations path. They, they kind of, a lot of people who join the SEALs look at it like an Olympic sport, like, man, I, and some of them were Olympians, like Navy SEAL candidates are some of the brightest and best athletes in the world. Like all the enlisted guys have degrees from places like Harvard and Colgate and Stanford and same with the officers, but most of the officers come from the Naval Academy or ROTC. And many of them are just elite athletes. We have Olympic level athletes who become SEALs and whatnot. So they're already like extraordinarily successful. But to have this attitude that getting through Navy SEAL training and earning the coveted Navy SEAL Trident, which is the gold emblem, the metal emblem, which looks like an eagle, but it's an eagle actually based off the Budweiser can eagle because <laughs> the Navy SEAL designed it and um, thought that was pretty cool. And it was. So that represents air. And then there's the eagles carrying a pistol, flintlock pistol that represents land. And, um, and he's carrying a... Uh, Neptune's trident, King Neptune's trident, which is why we call it a trident, and that represents the sea. And then there's an anchor, which represents the Navy. So a lot of people think earning that is like standing on the podium, right, at a elite athletic event. Like that's their goal is to earn the trident. The difference between that and elite athlete sport, elite sport is that after you stand on the podium, you know, if you're an Olympic athlete, you get to go home. But in the Navy SEALs, you get to go to war and get shot at. You don't go home, right? So your, your reward for earning the trident is to go have someone try to kill you. And you're going to go kill them instead. And a lot of people who don't really put that level of thought into it, you know, they quit or they quit later. I had a guy at my first platoon. I was at SEAL Team 3. And this is in the, you know, of course, this is 1990 or 91. So the first Gulf War, that's how when I, I went through training in 1990. And so my platoon was training up and we were deploying and Desert Shield was just coming in. We were about ready to invade. And so we're getting up, you know, we're literally packing our pallets and get ready to go. And this guy comes into my office who was in my platoon named Thompson. And he said, Mark, my, I was a second in charge and my OC was there too. So Gene Peluso, he said, Mark, Gene, I, I'm not going to go. And like, <laughs> Both of our jaws like hit the deck. We're like, what? What do you mean you're not going to go? You're not going to go out tonight with us or what? He goes, no, I'm not going to go to Iraq. And we're like, what do you mean? Like, of course you're going. We're going. We're all going. He goes, no, I I'm not. And I looked at him and said, are you saying that you're going to be a conscious objector? Like, I don't think SEALs get to be conscious objectors. He goes, well, I'm, I've already talked to my pastor and, and um, yeah, I'm just not going to go. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> okay. And he was able to get out of the Navy as a conscious objector, but boy, we were all pissed. The whole team was so pissed at him because, you know, he went through SEAL training to get that trident. And then he went through an entire Navy SEAL workup to get all the cool guy training, you know, of running and gunning and locking out of submarines, just everything like I saw on that poster. He got to do all that. But then when it came, you know, came time to do the job, he quit. Wish he had quit in buds, you know, or never signed up. So it's so important to make sure you really know why you're doing things, especially when it's really hard, like the SEALs. But it really applies to anything in life because if, even if it's not hard, it's going to be hard for you if you choose poorly. Like if I had stayed as a CPA, even if I'd, you know, stayed in, in that or uh, that career, or if I'd gone back to the family business, which was more likely, life would have been really freaking hard for me right? You know, my family was, my family was an alcoholic, is an alcoholic family. And, you know, I wasn't exempt from that. And so I'd probably be a hot mess, right? If I had not studied myself through meditation to recognize that 
you know, of the, the totality of really who I was and what my calling was, and then to go after that, right? So it works in both ways. Like either if you don't align with your calling, but you're aware of it, you live a life of regret. If you don't do any self-awareness and you just follow the path of the story that you're fed, then you're going to live a life of misery because you're not going to be in alignment with your calling. And all these obstacles are going to be thrown up at you to try to wake you up to that calling. And if you keep ignoring it because you're, you know, basically distracting yourself with alcohol or drugs or constant busyness and doing this and grasping for more money, more achievement, more success, more business growth, whatever that is, then, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll be miserable. And then when you're on your deathbed, that's when you'll experience the regret and it'll be too late to do anything about it. Right. Yeah. Having that strong why I can imagine being so important for getting through the training and making it worth it. And then also what you talked about earlier, uh, where, you know, you're being put under such psychological duress that if your mind is unable to stay present in meditation, we learn quickly the difference between pain and suffering mm -hmm. and how the mind creates most of that suffering through its projections into the future and its anticipation mm -hmm. of more pain or its replay of past pain. And so I can see how those practices would have come into, uh, you know, would have come into, come into handy for you in training. Right. Um, you, you talk about how you went from being a warrior to a warrior monk. And I'm really interested in how you've managed to integrate all these practices, Ashtanga, CrossFit, Ninjutsu, and mm -hmm. the SEAL training into this kind of badass, uh, you know, all-in-one training platform. Yeah, that's a cool story too. So, you know, obviously I was deeply inspired by my initial four years of Zen training. And I wouldn't say, I mean, I consider myself a lifelong Zen practitioner, but, you know, sort of like what we learned with Dan Brown's training, you know, ultimately it doesn't matter what you call it, right? I wasn't the type of practitioner who really cared about a certain cultural tradition. And, and I recognized that, um, you know, certain things worked for me in certain times in my life and then they stopped working or, that um, certain practices had a, a certain effect. And so I began to really explore. I explored different concentration training techniques, visualization, mantra, um, you know, breath work, mindfulness, insight, you know, Zajjan, all of which I consider like, like Zen to me is a, it just means whole mind or integration, like yoga, the term yoga, most people think is, you know, yoga means to do stretchy bendy practice. And it actually means integration or to yoke your, um, your mind and your spirit, you know, into an integrated whole. So I started to consider that what I was doing was whole mind training. And because I'm a very kinesthetic individual, and you know, an elite athlete and a Navy SEAL warrior, and I had a lot of experiences in the SEALs where my body was leading the charge. I was instinctually responding in a very um, powerful way. And, it, and my brain was not, you know, brain was obviously involved, but it wasn't, it wasn't conscious. So I really started to trust my body's instincts and intuition. And so I started to look at my body as part of my, my whole body as my mind, mind, body connection still lends one to think that they're separate but connected and what i experienced in my most peak state flow moments which happened for long periods of time in the military and the seals was that the body is the mind it's in, the mind and the body are, are are one it's sort of like you know this idea that thoughts and your witnessing self are separate it's not really true thoughts arise out of the ground of being so they're inclusive. The body arises out of your ground of being of existence. So it's inclusive. It's, it's included in it. So it's all one. So I, start, I wanted to train myself like that. Because most training is, you know, you have your body and you maybe go to the gym and you work your body out, but then you don't really think of it as, you know, a, an important aspect of your thinking, 
you know, being. And then mental training is, you know, academic, right? So you learn things. And I know you don't, and most of your listeners probably don't, but you know, the average person doesn't think of mental training as unlearning, right? Or disconnecting from thoughts or practicing direct perceiving, right? Or practicing empathy and listening with your heart, right? And then also, then I also, because of my um, upbringing, which had a lot of chaos and violence and codependence and alcoholism, I, no matter how much meditation training I did, I still found myself torpedoing my, my efforts with dysfunctional patterns that would come up, which we would call emotional shadow. And so I, I wanted to really work on that. And I knew that that was an important part of my growth. That if I didn't work on my emotional life, then no amount of meditation was going to help because I was going to have those wounds that needed to be healed. So when I started to put it all together, I was like, okay, so this is physical training. I need to do hardcore functional fitness, train my body like a, a master martial artist. And then I needed to train my mind in these various ways. So what tools do I know how to train my mind? I knew the breath could be the bridge between the body and the mind to kind of cross over. So I began to explore a lot of breath practices. I took like, you know, thousands of hours of yoga training and, you know, I've got like 800 hours of certifications. So I learned a lot through yoga, but I also learned a lot through Nakamura and then uh, my ninjutsu, Saito ninjutsu and um, Sansu Kung Fu and now Aikido and, and chai, uh, Qigong and Tai Chi. So I dabbled in all those things. And I just said, let, let me take what works and shit can what doesn't. So all the breath work, the breath work, like I said, was a bridge between the body and mind. Then I started working on concentration training. So I've had a mantra practice for years and um, imagery work, right? Which I picked up first in sports for swimming, but then I began to use it a, to get into the Navy SEALs and then use it as a SEAL. And... Um, mindfulness, you know, all these different things, everything I can get my hands on or find. And I, I, you know, to this day, I read at least one book a, a week and I'm trying, I'm working on one book a day, right? But sometimes life gets in the way there. So I just began a deep, you know, practice of reading for mental development and expanding my horizons, whatnot. And then for emotional development, I, First, I married a therapist, but that's not why. But um, she led me into therapy and EMDR and things like the Hoffman process. God bless the Hoffman process. Their property just burned down two days ago up in Helena, California. It's really horrible. I know they'll be fine. Nobody died. But the Hoffman process is a seven-day deep dive into your childhood trauma stuff. It's really transformative. Hundreds of thousands of really you know solid professionals have done it. So what I love about emotional development is once you get into it, you realize that, hey, this is just normal. It's just stuff you have to do. Whereas, you know, most guys fear it, you know, or they just think they don't need it because they don't even connect with their emotions. But so we're not talking about emotions like, like you wear on your sleeve, although they would f maybe part of it, but we're, we're really talking about subconscious patterning and biases that drive your behavior. Just like, you know, what led me to think that I was meant to be in the family business and the patterns that led me to drop bombs, you know, by maybe drinking too much and saying the stupid stuff, right? That's emotional work. So I, I really started working on that in my 30s. And then um, because I had had so many profound intuitive experiences in the SEALs, you know, just knowing shit that I didn't have any business knowing, I really wanted to develop my intuition more. So I started path of where can I learn about this it led me to like Apache warrior scout training and silent retreats and you know working with sensory deprivation and stuff like that and then because of my experience that I described in the beginning here with you know being led to my calling by my let's just say by my spirit or my soul I mean it's beyond our real knowing of how that happens but and how profoundly it affected my life and the fact that I couldn't possibly imagine my life had I not found my calling. And then experience of I had, you know, teaching SEALs about this, there was this fifth component that I wanted to bring in. So what I've described so far, are four aspects to integrated training that is unbeatable mind, you know, the sign behind me. 
um, physical development, mental development, emotional development, and intuitive development. And those are all, you know, fairly like easy to wrap your head around. But the fifth one was, I didn't want to call it because spiritual development, because, you know, spiritual, there's spiritual development, in every one of those other four mountains, right? And so for a lot of people, spiritual development, you know, could mean like prayer or church or be related to some religion or esoteric practice that that is called something, you know, which has like a cult, cultural slash cultish feel to it. And so that word has a lot of baggage. I didn't want to call it that. So I, I'm very, because I was moved by this idea of the warrior traditions having these profound insights and the warriors are always in service, right? And because they're always in service to humanity as protectors, they've got to master themselves at all levels. And so this idea of mastery and service started to come to me early on. And I said, so there's the practices of mastery, which are developing yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitively. That's self-mastery. But then there's this, the practice of service, which you do when you're in alignment with your calling or Dharma. If you're not in alignment, you're not really serving the world properly or yourself because you're just going to have to repeat the lesson, right? In your next lifetime. And so I, I called it Kokoro, which means your heart and your mind merged into your actions in service. And it could also mean whole mind, which is very similar to what you, the term yoga and Zen means. So that became the fifth domain or fifth mountain of training. So what we've done or what I did is starting with Navy SEALs, I put together a training program. The early version of this was through my company SealFit, where I train, I developed these protocols to train people, train the students physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitionally, and Kokoro, or heart, mind, immersion, action, and service. And we would train in these deep immersion programs for 30 days, like a warrior monk academy, like American Shaolin Academy. We start up, you know, five in the morning, we train to eight or nine at night, lights out at 10. We did this around the clock with one day off during the 30 day training. And the event would end with a 50 hour crucible, which is nonstop training, which tested you physically, mentally, emotionally, intuitionally, and spiritually, you know, <laughs> is profound. The training was completely transformative. The Navy SEAL candidates who went through that with me, 90% of them made it through SEAL training. And, and the very few who didn't is because they got really bad injuries somehow. And so I had a lot of civilians start to come to the training. And then um, I, I literally just couldn't keep it up personally because there was nobody else I had who could teach the depth of these five mountains the way I taught them. So I started to chunk it out into different pieces. And um, the physical training got chunked out into shorter programs that we run through seal fit you know different camps and and shorter uh, seminars and the mental the, fi the entire five mountain training got spun out into something called unbeatable mind so i wrote a book and i created an online training around that and now we have 400 certified coaches to teach unbeatable mind and then my integrated practice daily practice got spun out into something called kokoro yoga and I wrote a book about that and we have an online training we were going to turn that into a whole separate business but i really have just run out of time you know, so it was an intensely, this all started happening in, uh, in, in 2006, I had gotten off active duty, but then I got mobilized to Iraq and, um, it was in Iraq that I really put the, the daily practice all together and started to really think this through, right? Think, oh, how do I integrate this training? You know, how do I, how do I still be physically strong and courageous as a warrior, but also be a you know, a meditator, um, develop this spiritual alignment, you know, with my calling and all these things, the intuition and my, you know, and I thought about all the warrior traditions of the ancient times, you know, like the, the Apache scouts and the Spartans and the you know, samurai and the ninja, they all had this quality of, you know, balance between the, the hard and the soft, you know, you could see a images of like Mio Mata Masashi sitting on a bench meditating, then exploding, you know, if someone were to approach him from behind and he just sensed him exploding up and into, you know, readiness. And that's what I was really trying to create. And it's been extraordinarily effective. So the training I call um, vertical development. Well, the outcome is vertical development, meaning you, do, you evolve your whole being, your character by integrating 
and accelerating your growth across those five domains of physical, mental, emotional, intuitional, and Kokoro. And the training program becomes like a daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annually thing where there's things that you will do for those five domains daily. And then there's other things you might do weekly and then quarterly. And then there's like one thing you might do annually that really brings it all together. It doesn't have to be across all five domains, but you know, there's certainly one. And the daily practices are done in, uh, in a ritualistic format, morning ritual and evening ritual, right? Becomes five mountain training. And then your workout becomes five mountain training. So we don't work out just like, just to look good at the beach. You know, our training is the way we teach it. The training is, um, meant to evolve you. That's why we call it an evolution. That's why the seals call all their training evolutions because you're meant to be a different person, you know, at the end of it than you were when you started it. It's because you have to tap into a level of yourself that, you know, you didn't know before. So every training session, you meet a new version of yourself and then you bring that per version forward. And we do this by integrating intentionality, breath work, visualization, task focusing, presencing, you know, like radically simple micro goals, um, team focus. So we like to train as teams, doesn't have to be, but even if you're not with other people, your team's in your mind with imagery and supporting you and service. So you're doing this, right? You're doing the training session in service to, you know, either God and humanity or, or whatever your higher power is, right? So you're checking your ego, you're constantly evolving, refining. And then, you know, for longer or for training sessions, you know, that have a, a level of suffering involved, such as a long endurance event or like our seal fit operator workouts, it becomes mindfulness practice, hmm. right? So instead of doing, you try to surrender into the beingness of it and, and to really practice. It's kind of like Dan talking about the Zajin. The intention of these practices is not to stay sitting on a bench for the rest of your life or a mat. It's to not have to do that. To take it off the mat and get to the point where you're, every moment is training until the, where right. you don't, there's no training left to do. It's just you just being present and burning off karma, you know? So that's what we attempt to do through our physical training sessions, through the morning ritual and the evening ritual, and then what we call spot drills. You know, spot drills, like, you know, if I finish up this podcast, maybe I'll do 10 burpees and 10 deep breaths and clear my mind. Hmm. And, and do stuff like that five or 10 times a day. And, you know, the practice does start to accrue, right? Hmm. The energy. So you do spot drill can be physical, can be mental, can be emotional. Like, okay, I'm going to go have that, um, that crucial conversation that I've been avoiding. Hmm. Right? Or I'm just going to walk around and, and just really, really listen to what's going on by asking some, you know, some nice question, questions like, you know, how are, how are things going, John? You know, what's going on with your life? What's coming up for you right now? Hmm. You know, so I'm just listening. So that's emotional development, really connecting to people, getting to the heart. We're taking a walk in nature and I'll just walk over to the beach and I'll just sit and I'll, I'll use the lion's gaze, just staring out at the ocean. Yeah. 10 minutes of that, just complete game changer. Then I walk back and go into the next, you know, deep work session. Yeah. So in beatable mind, you know, to summarize is like the culmination of my life work, starting with my introduction to Zen with Nakamura and then all, all that I learned in the seals and, and this intense period of exploration of all these different, modalities and integrating them, especially in Iraq when I, you know, I didn't like, I wasn't going to just do the st status quo, run around the compound and do some pull-ups and sit-ups and push-ups like the rest of my teammates. I was going to continue my training. And so I really, that's where that practice of Kokoro yoga evolved, where all the training was included all five mountains. Mm -hmm. And it was a hardcore, I stayed eminently fit, but I also did traditional asana and some Qigong and some the breath work and imagery and even a 20 minute little high intensity interval and if an hour and a half and boy, it's amazing, amazing work. So integrate five mountains to master yourself through vertical growth, meaning evolving your consciousness every day, taking it one day at a time, one day, one lifetime, and doing that so that you can serve more powerfully day in and day out in alignment with your calling. Hmm. And it's a really powerful formula. And I know there's other formulas out there, but I consider Unbeal Mind to be 
like a Western path to truly to integration, integrated enlightenment, awaken awareness, but in service to humanity in a way that's unique for everybody. Hmm. And you don't necessarily get that language in it because like a Trojan horse, I didn't, I didn't want to scare anyone. When I created it in 2012, you know, people weren't quite as awake as they are today. And still people aren't quite awake at a broad level, but there's a growing population. Like I couldn't have ever had this conversation five years ago, even that I'm having with you. There's just nobody to have it with, except for, you know, a spiritually enlightened person like Dan, you know what I'm saying? Or, or my yoga teachers. Yep. But so I'm really optimistic about the future, even though the world's kind of a shit show right now. It's just because, you know, it's the outward, outward negative projection of billions of people who have lived in negativity for so long. But if we can, if we can get through like your work and my work and thousands like us, if we can help consciousness evolve to be more positive and to project positive energy out, then that'll change really quickly. The same thing with the earth. Like everyone's fretting and wringing their hands about the earth. And I'm like, well, all we've got to do is change consciousness and mother earth will change with us. Yep. And, and you know, there's no amount of carbon tax that's going to do anything for mother earth. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's just silly. Yeah. It really is our collective minds that are building this collective reality. Yeah. That's and correct. Yeah. I think your your work, it, you know, this is the future of integrating these different mind training uh, practices in a non dogmatic way, where you're right. looking at taking the best, drawing the best from different traditions and cultures, and um, and also focusing on character because I think that part is often left out of a lot of the Eastern uh, spiritual traditions. Is that um, and, well, and a lot of them include it in their own way, but in a, when you bring it into a Western context. Um, I've met so many people who, you know, have claimed that they're very far along on their path and you can just immediately see these, these character flaws that are, are right. coming through. And, and so, um, what I like about your program and what you, what you teach is this idea of, you know, really building, working on self-discipline, resilience, um, character and, and values yeah. and yeah. our, um, mutual friend, I think Neil Pestricha talks about how we're, yeah. our society yeah. is this society of porcelain dolls. Um, mm. These, you know, very fragile mindset where we're all constantly pointing and blaming others for our problems. And I think that um, resilience and character are really just crucial if we're going to make it through all this together. No, no doubt. It takes great humility. Humility is a practice. And uh, you're right. I think that um, anyone who professes to be super spiritually advanced or is wearing some special clothing, right, or is, uh, has some sort of positional power or rank in a spiritual tradition, to me is suspect because the most spiritually advanced people that I've seen are probably the most normal. Right. Right. That there's nothing abnormal about spiritual development in terms of like how you should act or what you should wear or what flowery words you should say you know what i mean like the girls who teach the yoga classes are you know to use all the flowery words and then and then they'll go out and smoke a cigarette and i know this is a really that was kind of judgmental so i shouldn't say that but um in, in my lesson or my teaching and my insight is that the more advanced, the more evolved you get, the more humble you get and the less you need to judge because you recognize you're imperfect. And it's like Jesus said, you know, if I point my finger at you, then there's three pointing back at me. Mm. And so you just become more quiet because you're afraid that, you know, if, not afraid, but you recognize that, you know, most of what comes out of your mouth is filtered through your ego is, you know, suspect. And you get, you get really suspicious of bias because you know we're baked in bias and you see that all around us with you know the whole the racial issues it's no one's fault there's no one to blame everyone's bias mm -hmm. blacks are biased whites are biased you know greens are biased <laughs> so just you, know, you just recognize it through meditative practice and you become really humble and quiet about that it's like wow yeah i'm biased and certainly am um completely you know and on one hand, a complete hot mess from my family of origin. On the other hand, I'm very grateful for that. I wouldn't have been a Navy SEAL were it not for that. 
Right. And um, it gave me some tremendous grist and insight for further development. And by the way, everything is the way it is because it's meant to be that way. So nothing's broken. Everything's perfect the way it is. And even the world is a mess, is the way it's supposed to be just because we're coming out of a really dark period of you know, history that's last thousands of years. And it's just the collective momentum of that. And it's going to take a long time to turn that around. But it can turn around quickly if we can get hundreds of millions and then a billion people to a consciousness of love where they're not projecting negativity in the world, they're projecting love. And then boom, they'll change super quickly. Yeah. I believe anyways. I agree. So yes, yeah, spirituality isn't like, yeah, I'm a 10th degree black belt in yoga. You know, and I know those don't exist, but or I've gone to 12 of Dan Brown's retreats, you know, and I've got all the language down. Right. And a lot of people trap themselves in knowledge and they mistake knowledge for wisdom. Yep. So the most humble person, you know, that might be the most advanced. It reminds me of a book called Razor's Edge by Somerset Vaughn, I think was his name. And these, you know, this is when yoga became first popular, like in the 20s. And these group was living in Paris and they were like dabbling with meditation and yoga and doing the socialite thing. And they felt all really special. And there was one guy who joined them, an American who had gone to war, was in the war and came back. And he was like, yeah, he was not really into all the outer trappings and the whatnot. And, and um, he was super smart. And he, you know, he tried to like a really fancy job and just didn't like it. And he ended up driving a cab in New York City. Hmm. And what he had recognized that all these other people didn't recognize is kind of what we're talking about is that every moment is your practice. Every moment is your practice. You take in a breath and you connect to, you know, awakened awareness and then you exhale that breath and you feel grateful for this moment. And so his service was to bring that awesome presence to his passengers in his taxi. Mm. And that was enough for him, right? To be present for them. While all his friends, you know, needed the fancy titles and the jobs and to be seen in the social aid circus, circuits and to be seen as someone who is spiritual. Isn't that interesting? I love that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and it's so true from what I've observed as well. It just makes a lot of sense. Um, but uh, listen, I want to be respectful of your time. I usually end these podcasts with a few rapid fire questions if you're up for it. Sure thing. So who is your favorite historical leader? Oh, uh, King Leonidas, who led the 300 Spartans to their death against the Persians and saved Western culture. Nice. Great movie. <laughs> yeah, 300. No doubt. Those guys are badasses. Uh, what's your, briefly, your morning ritual? Okay. Um, I'll, talk, I'll, do, I'll do brief for you. I wake up, have a, um, a liter of water, and then I do box breathing. And uh, if I have time, I'll do 20 minutes. If not, I'll just do five minutes. I have a gratitude practice before that. You know, I wake up, mm -hmm. start my gratitude practice, drink my water, lead me into box breathing. And then I, um, I have, I review my, what I call my personal ethos and stand. So my, my purpose, my mission, my vision, and what I stand for. I read it every day and often fine tune. That's, that's, fi that's the fifth mountain of Kokoro alignment. Like I'm making sure that I'm still in alignment and that I'm doing, and then I compare that to what my plan is for the day. And I make sure that I'm in alignment. And if I, if I'm not, I can always make a change to my schedule and say no to somebody, you know, or change something. And then I'll come into the office and begin my integrated training, hmm. which lasts for two hours. So, you know, so I, I'm fortunate as a business owner that I can first three, you know, I wake up at four 30 and um, I train usually till seven 30 or eight in the morning. And then, you know, I'm, I'm working or writing or doing something by nine, you know, clean up time and food time in between there. Hmm. So training founds, you know, forms the foundation of every day. Awesome. 
pretty sweet. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Um, what's your top warrior movie and top warrior book that you'd recommend? Oh man, there's so many good warrior books. Of course, you have to read Sun Tzu's The Art of War, and I love Neil Masashi's uh, Masashi's book of Five Rings. Um, but I would say there's this book called um, The Way of the Seal by this guy named Mark Devine, which is definitely on the top of my list. I've heard of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and as far as movies, you know, I don't, I don't really watch. I don't watch TV, and um, I would say. For me, one that really, really is, is represents the warrior spirit is The Matrix with Keanu mm -hmm. Reeves, even though it's not a yeah. war movie. Right? Seen it's as a Dharma really, movie, too. It's a Dharma movie. It's definitely about what, a lot of what we're talking about, you know. Anyways, getting clear about your story and going out and doing something about it, right? right? That's the warrior's way. And starting by unplugging from the, <laughs> the right, matrix is now Such become great the, metaphors, the right? attention economy. <laughs> exactly. Um, all right. Uh, two more for <coughs> you here. Your favorite mental training exercise. Box breathing, because I believe everyone needs to start there. So the con controlled nostril breathing, five count in, five count hold, five count out, five count hold. Because here's what is powerful about this Ian. First, it's it's the physiological practice of arousal control. So mm -hmm. every breath, breathing through your nose, you activating your diaphragm, triggers parasympathetic nervous system and begins to bleed off stress and calms you down. So you practice it every day, then you know you'll be the calmest person in the world. Second, like I mentioned earlier, the breath is the bridge between the body and the mind and the spirit. So every box breathing training, you're also training your mind. And it's through concentration first by using the breath and that pattern as your object of concentration. So you use this almost like in, in lieu of the elephant path, just inhale, like Dan had the seven part breath and the three, you know, this becomes your breath, but you're getting the arousal control and the concentration benefits. And then, um, and then of course you drop the concentration object and then you've got mindful awareness or witnessing. Sure. Right? And then at the end of the box breathing practice, you add the imagery work. And so you can practice mm -hmm. future manifestation um, which has a powerful, the, the reason future visualization or manifestation works is because you're basically creating a, a memory of a future that hasn't yeah. happened yet. Right. Plant that flag out in the future and you'll right. you start heading there. It. Right. It's like a gravitational pull. Of course, there's a lot more to it than that. And you got to make sure that future that you're visualizing is aligned with your dharma or else right. you'll be heading in the wrong direction fast. Yeah. So box breathing is, and a lot of times people fail with meditation or they really struggle with it. And it's because they're just too agitated. Their body and their brain is too agitated. And so box breathing de-agitates them so that they can go deeper into their mental training. Mm. I even think that was missing in the translation of the um, Tibetan stuff to America is, you know, they missed that. It's kind of like yoga. Missed the reason for the asana was to prepare for the breath work, pranayama, which was to prepare for concentration, which then prepared you for meditation. Yeah. And us Westerners, you just, we want to go straight from zero to hero. <laughs> yeah. And us Westerners also have a different baseline than probably a traditional uh, Tibetan. So, you know, right. you think about our, our modern lifestyle is so sympathetically activated that we need right. that breathing practice to then right. have a foundation from which. That's right. To, Absolutely. Well said. I agree with that. So the final question I have is just what is your current kind of mission and goals well, I'm, I'm going through transition, but my current mission, uh, I'll have to report back to you on where I'm going with the next phase, but it'll be tied to this. This part won't change, is to um, transform 100 million through this path that we've been talking about. I call it unveil mind, but through a, you know, a westernized path that makes clear and concise sense to people and they can really engage with it very quickly and then they, you know, they commit to it. 100 million people by 2045. Hmm. And um, I'm doing that through certifying thousands of unbeatable mind coaches. Awesome. So our goal is 5,000 coaches by 2025. And uh, that's a BHAG for sure. And I'm going to support that obviously by, you know, as the company founder and owner, and then through my podcasts and through books and, and um, you know, speaking platforms and stuff like that. Yeah. And where can folks find that material and connect with you? Uh, 
markdevine.com is my personal website. It has a lot of stuff that's going to be going through a transition soon, but it's still it's good enough for now. And then um, unbeatablemind.com is the website for the uh, program we're talking about and the coaching certification. And my books are on Amazon or wherever books are sold. I recommend it if you're really interested to start with Unbeatable Mind or The Way of the Seal. They're both kind of different versions of our comp. Yeah, the wow. way that, there you go. Boom. Look at you. Unbeatable mind is like the inner practices. The way of the seal is like how to kick ass in the world and bring these practices to, to bear. Ooh, yeah. Right on. Well, thanks so much for the work you're doing and for Thank coming you. on the podcast. Yeah, it's been a blast. Really enjoyable to talk to you. Thank you for, uh, for the work you're doing and good luck with it. Fit mind. It's awesome. Thanks.